Sarah Flournoy and I'm here with Lauren Simpson. Lauren, can you tell us a little bit about how this beautiful wildscape came to be? Well, I want to thank you so much, for, Sarah, for letting me talk today about wildscaping and about our gardens here at St. Julian's Crossing Wildlife Habitat. So, um, to answer your question, this process started probably in earnest about three years ago, a little bit before that, um, after we had the big drought in the region. So we were on a tough love policy, and if our plants lived, they lived, and if they died, they died. And then after most of our plants had died, because of course most did, we decided um, that we wanted to be a little more ecologically responsible in our choice of plants in future. So we uh, decided to put in drought tolerant plants, and also to really try and focus on nectar sources for, at the time, butterflies, which we thought were pretty and we wanted to support. So we had a couple of friends who did a really nice job landscaping and putting in nectar sources and indeed the nectar sources were drought tolerant and they did give food to some butterflies and bees. But of course they were not native primarily. In fact I think only maybe one or two of the many plants we had were native either to Texas or to our eco region. So it was a learning process Sarah. Um, over time, I got involved with the Oak Forest community of gardeners here in our neighborhood. I also got active with the Native Plant Society of Texas. I met people um, like Doris Hurd and yourself from um, Audubon Society and from other local groups and realized that it's not just having nectar, it's having the right kind of nectar. And not just nectar, but pollen. And not just that, but the kind of leaves that insects need to thrive. And so that meant focusing more on native plants. So I would say now, and again, this happens over time slowly, we're probably about 80 plus percent Texas plants in our wildscape. However, it's still a learning process, and I am now learning that a lot of those plants are not native to our little region of Texas, our eco-region. And so, as things naturally die out and there becomes space or as we expand our gardens, we're starting to focus on those Texas plants that are native to our eco-region here because those are the most supportive of all kinds of wildlife. Insects, birds, reptiles, and so forth. Anyway, that's how our gardens came about. We've often heard that in yard habitats, it's important to look intended rather than untended. Can you give us a few tips on how you employ these principles? Sure, sir, I'd be happy to. So of all the tips that I give, I think there are three that I would really mention here just quickly. The first is I would intentionally border your garden beds. So I would have distinct beds and I would border them um, in a couple of different ways. The first is you can use rocks to border them, or as we have done at St. Julian's Crossing here at home, use a sort of metal edging. You can also, as we've done here, um, you'll see photos later, I'm sure, put in pathways. And the reason that I say to have discrete beds that are bordered is that in an urban setting, especially um, with, in a suburban setting with homes, it just gives that crispness and neatness that people are used to. You know, a wildscape looks a little different from the traditional manicured lawn and garden. I think in beautiful ways, sort of like a cottage garden. But if this were to go all the way to the edge of the property with nothing to break it up visually, as an aesthetic matter, it probably wouldn't be as pleasing. And also, neighbors might be um, wondering if it was sort of unintentional and just uh, filled with weeds. Does that make sense? So I would suggest making discrete beds with, with edges on it if you're in an urban setting. The second tip that I would give is that I would plant in clusters or groups of color and flower. Uh, so I'm not sure if this will show in this video, but behind us we have clusters of purple coneflower, clusters of a couple of different types of yellow um, coneflowers, Rebecca species, and Salvia coccinea, which is scarlet sage. There are a couple of reasons to do this. An aesthetic reason is that it makes it look like you planned out your garden a little more. 
So the eye is not distracted by a bunch of things jumbled together. Great in a prairie setting, but in an urban area with neighbors around, it makes it look like you planned it out. So that's the first reason is an aesthetic and be a good neighbor kind of reason. The second reason is that a lot of invertebrates, so insect species, practice what we call flower constancy. And when I say a lot, it's primarily bees and it's certain species. Um, I don't even know which, but I plant for it just to capture them. So what that means is they want to visit more than just one flower at a time of the same species, of the same variety. So if I have a clump of scarlet sage, Salvia coccinea, then they can visit a bunch of flowers in sort of a one-stop shopping. It's like going to a mall instead of driving all across town to get to specialty stores. So it's easier for them. And then some insects like uh, butterflies, certain butterflies can see better when you have a cluster of the same color. So that's why my second recommendation to make it look intentional and also to support the critters is to have mounds of color and species. The third recommendation I have, and you'll see it I think in some of the still photos, is to put up signage of some kind if your deed restrictions allow it. You must read those deed restrictions. Mine do. Um, this was a tip I got from Jaime Gonzalez uh, from the Katy Prairie Conservancy. So what we've done as we've gotten our certifications as a certified butterfly habit with North American Butterfly Association, a certified wildlife habitat with um, uh, National Wildlife Federation and a Monarch Way Station with Monarch Watch is that we have gone ahead and gotten the metal plaques for them and we mount them on a small sign. It's about the size of a realtor sign and we put that on a couple of stilts in our front yard along with a little flip case that has flyers in it for people to take. And the flyers describe what wildscaping is, how it can be done at home, and then on the back it has a list of resources, so like the Audubon Society, Native Plants Society, um, Native Bee Allies, Texas Pollinator Pow Wow, and things like that. So what, what Mr. Gonzalez said was, whatever you do, make it look intentional, and having a sign really makes it look intentional. And of course, once you educate people about what's going on, they get really excited about it. And so I've had complete strangers message me on my Facebook educational community because they found our flyer they saw the kinds of uh, wildlife it was supporting, and they wanted advice on how to do it themselves. And that's what it's all about, is communicating to people. So those are my three primary tips, I would say, if you want to make your gardens look intentional. And I would say we're all ambassadors, right? People who wildscape. So we want to make our areas look intentional, because then people won't associate wildscaping with junky or messy. They'll associate it with beauty.